Hello friends, arrays is actually one of the most popular data structures out there and you are very likely to encounter an array question in any of your technical interviews. So for that I have decided to take the 10 most asked most popular array questions and put them in a single video. So in this video you would be able to find the questions that has been asked in hundreds of companies thousands of times and these companies are all ranging from like big, talk, big tech companies like Google, Facebook, Yahoo, Amazon, Microsoft and also a bunch of smaller companies. So I highly encourage you that if you want to master your technical interviews start with these questions it will be really helpful and now let's just get started. Today we are going to do the number one problem inside the lead to code which is to some problem and this question has been literally asked by hundreds of companies hundreds of times. Uh, any company that you want to get a job of at least have asked this question at some point in their history. Uh, if we see the list of companies it's like Amazon, Adobe, Google, Apple, Microsoft, Facebook, Bloomberg, Uber. Expedia, Spotify, Goldman Sachs, and then also companies like TCS, SAP, Square, uh, Snapchat, ByteDance, Twitter, ServiceNow, and these are just some of the companies that are my dream companies that have already already asked this problem, and that's why I'm paying my utmost attention. I hope you also enjoy the video. So this is a lead code easy problem and probably the most like problem on lead code. Uh, basically we are given an array, uh, integer array of numbers and we are also given an integer value target and we need to return the indices of two numbers such that they sum up to this target value that we are given. So if we try to understand this with an example, suppose the, uh, we are given the values like 2, 7, uh, 11 and 15 and we are also given a target value is th uh, 9. So in this case, we can clearly see that this 2 and 7, if we sum that up, it becomes 9. And uh, that's why in this case, we need to return the index values of this one. So index values would be 0 and 1. And this would be the answer we need to return. Uh, also, in the another example, uh, we are given the values as 3, 2 and 4. And we are given the target value to be 6. Now, because the target value is 6, we can actually do 3 plus 3 equals to 6 as well in this case, but this is not the correct approach because we only have one 3 and we don't have the other 3. So this would not be the correct solution. The correct solution would actually be 2 plus 4. So if we do 2 plus 4, it would become the 6. So that's why in this case, we will need to return the index value as uh, 1 and 2. And this would be the answer. It's really easy to understand the problem statement. Let's see that what could be the different approaches to solve this problem. Okay, so first of all, we are going to solve this in brute force way. And the idea is that at any point we are iterating over, we need to find that what is the remaining value from this target number. So suppose we are checking that whether one exists in a pair that sums up to this value number 13. What we are going to do is we are going to do 13 minus one. So we'll get the remaining value as 12. Now we need to check that whether inside the remaining portion of the array, whether this 12 exists or not. So if 12 exists, we can actually return the index values. But in this case, 12 does not exist. Uh, if we iterate over all the values, so we can simply return, uh, simply ignore this first case saying that there exists no pair where one is part of it which sums up to 13. Now we will start repeating the same process for the remaining values. So now we are at this value number 8 again we will do 13 minus 8 so the value becomes 5. Now we will check that whether this 5 exists inside the remaining array. So we will check the remaining values and we can see that 5 already exists over here. So because 5 exists over here and 8 also exists over here we can return the index values. So in this case the index value for 8 is going to be 1 and index value for this uh, 5 is going to be 4 and this would be our answer. So this solution would work perfectly fine but what is the issue with this solution is actually the time complexity is going to be big O of n square. Why n square? Because notice that for every single element we will have to check all the other elements that whether a certain remaining value exists or not and uh, we could re repeating the same process for all the elements so that's why this is the uh, big O of n square time complexity. The question is can we do something better and the answer is yes. Let me quickly show you how. Okay, so we will use the same example. Now, previously, we know that in the brute force, we were doing uh, big O of n square time complexity. Why? Because at every single element, if we wanted to find that, okay, for the remaining value, this is going to be 13 minus one, the remaining value is going to be 12. So in order for us to find this remaining value, we had to iterate over all the places inside the given input array. But what if we can shorten that time? And one way to do is it, that whatever this given input is, currently it is unsorted. If we sort this given input, so the sorted value or the sorted array would become something like this 1, 2, 5, 8 and 15. Now this is the sorted array. 
now what we are going to do is uh, our target is still going to be this value number 13 but rather than checking those uh, remaining values inside this given original input we are actually going to do it inside the sorted input and let me quickly show you how so first of all we are going to do okay this value is 1 so we will we are going to do 13 minus 1 so the remaining value is 12 now we need to find that whether 12 exists inside the sorted array and this can be done actually in log n time why because we are going to do binary search uh, because this array is sorted and uh, we know that binary search actually takes log n time which we can do it pretty quickly so immediately we identify that okay 12 does not exist inside this given uh, array so we will uh, ignore this and we will move with the next element so now this one does not need it to be tested we will check for this value number two so we'll do 13 minus 2 so 13 minus 2 is actually going to be uh, 11 so 11 also does not exist and because 11 does not exist we can ignore this value number 2 as well now again we will check for this value number 5 so we if when we do 13 minus this value number 5 the remaining value becomes 8 and we can clearly see that okay 8 exists inside this given uh, sorted array and because 8 and 5 exist all we need to do is we need to return the index values so then we will iterate over this given input and we will try to find the index values of this 8 and 5 which we can actually do it in big o of n time and that we can simply return whatever the index value is and that would be our solution so this this approach is actually much better improvement than whatever our brute force approach was which had big o of n square time but what are the issues with this approach so if we see the time complexity in this case the time complexity is actually going to be big o of n log n to convert this original input from uh, its original form to the sorted form and uh, then it takes log n time to perform binary search and then it takes big of n time to do find the index values but all of that can be generalized to say that okay we need to complete this in big of n log n time now the question is can we do something better and can we do it in a linear time and the answer is less yes let me quickly show it to you how okay so again we are going to use the same example and what we are going to do is we are going to use a hash map now inside the hash map we are actually going to store two items as key value pair so as the key we are going to store the numbers inside this given array so we are going to store numbers as a key and we are going to store the index values as the uh, values for the those uh, particular numbers and what we are going to do is first of all we are going to do okay at any position we are going to find the remaining value so we are going to do 13 minus 1 so the remaining value in this case is going to be 12 and now we will try to see whether this 12 exists inside this given hash map and that can be done in constant time because uh, that is the property of hash map that is the beauty of hash map so we will try to see okay so 12 does not exist in this case so because 12 does not exist we will add this value and its index position to this hash map to see that whether in future we can use it or not so we will add the value as 1 and we'll add the index value as 0 again we will repeat the same process so now we will move on to the next value so the next value in this case is going to be value number 8 so uh, 13 minus 8 the remaining value is 5 but 5 does not exist inside the hash map yet so we will add an entry for this value number 8 and its index position as 1 again we will move on to the next value the next value is 15 so we'll do 13 minus 15 so 13 minus 15 is actually minus 2 and minus 2 does not exist over here so again we will add the value number 15 uh, to our hash map so we, uh, we will add an entry called 15 and the index value is 2 again for this 2 the 13 uh, the 11 does not exist so we will add an entry for this 2 and uh, the index value is 3 now when we are at this value number 5 uh, we will do 13 minus 5 so 13 minus 5 gives us the value as 8 now in the hash map we can clearly see that 8 exists over here and its index position is this one and we are iterating this 5 so we know that what is the index value of this 5 so we can clearly return the value of this uh, pair as 1 and 4 which is the corresponding index values of this 8 and 5 and that would be our solution and this answer would be the perfect solution uh, if we see the time and space complexity in this case the time complexity is actually going to be big O of n why because because we are iterating over this given input just once we don't have to do anything else uh, if we see the space complexity in this case the space complexity is also going to be big O of n because we have to create this additional hash map and we have to enter all the numbers that are present inside this given hash map uh, inside this given array and uh, let this would be the most optimal solution let's move on to coding now 
So first of all, we will create a hash map to store uh, the integer values. Once that is done, we will create a for loop and we will iterate over the given input. And first of all, we will calculate a variable called difference. And for this difference variable, we will do target minus whatever the current value from the array we are at. And then we have to check that if the value exists inside the hash map that we have created. If it does exist, we can actually return. And if the value does not exist, uh, we can actually add that entry to our hash map. And now out of the loop, we'll simply return null uh, because then otherwise it will give us an error. Let's try to run this code. Okay, seems like our solution is working. Let's try to submit the code. And our solution is actually pretty efficient. It's uh, almost like 99% faster than all the other solutions. And I would be posting this in the comments so you can check it out from there. Today we are going to do best time to buy and sell stocks late code problem. This question has a very real life practical application. That is why it is very famous amongst IT companies as an interview question. Uh, if we see some of the companies where I want to work at who have already asked this question, there are companies like Amazon, Microsoft, Facebook, Bloomberg, Google, Goldman Sachs, Apple, Uber, Snapchat, Yahoo, ByteDance, DoorDash, eBay, Netflix and Reddit. So that's why I'm paying my utmost attention. I hope you also enjoy the video. So this is a lead code easy problem and you can see that it has been one of the most like problems on lead code. If we try to understand the problem statement, basically we are given an array called prices where any single uh, value inside this given array indicates the price of that particular stock and that part on that particular day. Now we want to maximize our profit by choosing a single day to buy the stock and choosing a different day to sell the stock sometime in the future. And our aim is to maximize our profit. So if we try to see it with an example, suppose this is the example that we are given where we are given six different prices for a stock and we are told that we need to maximize the profit. So I have drawn it on a graph over here. So it makes things more uh, easy to understand. And we know that at any given position, it shows that what is the price of that particular stock so initially the stock price on first day was price 7 now on the second day the price fell down to price 1 so we are not making any profit we are actually going down and we are losing the money but if we see over here so this day it's 1 and this day the price is 5 so if we see over here between these two days we actually made a profit of four dollars again price fell next day to three dollars and then again price rise to six dollars so over here we lost two dollars over here we again made some gain of three dollars and uh, at the end the price was four so over here again we lost two dollars so the thing is if we just do it like this, uh, we don't get the maximized profits. Why? Because we are only seeing that what is the difference between e every single day. But if we see that if we do something, if we buy the stock on this particular day, which means that we are buying the stock when the stock price at, is at one. And if we sell the price when the stock price is at six, so which means if we sell when the stock price is at six, we can actually make a profit of $5 this is the answer we need to return that this is the maximum profit we can make uh, based on these stock prices. So let me show you that what would be the brute force approach and then I'll show you that what would be the optimal approach. So for the brute force approach, one thing we can do is that we take every single position of a buy and sell price for these given stocks, which means that we make every single pair. So first of all, we see that if we buy the stock at price seven and we sell at price one, again, we sell at price five, again, we sell at price three and so on and so forth. What is the maximum profit we are getting? And we will create a variable called profit and we will keep track that what is the maximum number we have found so far. Once we are done with this value number seven, we would ignore this case and then again, we will repeat the same thing with value number five. So we start buying. Uh, so we start that our buy price is at value number one. And again, we start checking all of the comparisons that what would be the profit. And eventually we would find a pair where buy value is one and sell value is actually six, which means that we would gain profit of five dollars. And then we will return this as our answer. Like this solution would work as expected. We will get the desired result. But the thing is, this is not the most optim optimal approach. Why this is not the most optimal approach? Because if we 
we see uh, the time complexity the time complexity in this case is actually going to be big O of n square why n square because for any single entry we will have to take a look at every single entry in the remaining array and we will iterate this process so that is why it is a very time consuming process and we need to find a way to do something better and uh, let me quickly show you that what would be the optimal solution in this case so for the optimal approach what we are going to do is we are actually going to see that uh, when do we get the maximized profit we only get the maximized profit when we buy at the lowest value and we sell at the highest value so this is the logic we are going to apply over here that uh, we are going to buy the stock at the lowest value and we are going to sell the stock at the highest value but the thing is it is not easy, as easy as finding like the maximum value and the minimum value because in this case maximum value is actually 7 and minimum value is actually 1 we don't need to get the difference of these two values because if we do that we will get an answer of 6 but the thing is uh, we are actually dealing with stocks so we can only buy stocks uh, in the past which means that if we decide to buy a stock over here we can only sell it afterwards we can't sell it uh, to a some value in the before so that's why that is one thing we need to keep track of that we have to make sure that this linear property of buying and selling is maintained in this case so what we are going to do is we are going to have a variable called buy and that is going to keep track of what is the minimum uh, value we have stored so far and we are going to see that at any given moment whatever the minimum buy value is if on that particular day we try to sell a stock what is the profit we are getting so let me quickly draw three variables over here so we are going to have three variables called buy sell and profit now first of all we are at this position number seven which means that we are buying the stock at seven and we can't do anything about it because we don't have any way to sell it uh, so we will start with the second position so now on the second day the stock price fell down to one which means that if we can we have already bought this stock at value number seven if we try to sell it at value number one it really does not give much progress but one thing we can do over here is that because today the stock price is actually low we can reduce that whatever the buying price is from 7 to 1 so we will do that so now the buy price is actually 1 and uh, we are not selling anything or we are not doing anything again now the next day the uh, price is uh, price of the stock is 5 so we'll try to do that okay what is the 5 minus 1 which is the minimum price we have bought stock so far and 5 minus 1 is actually 4 which is the maximum profit we have made so far and we don't need to update this buy value because we have already bought it at a lower price than whatever the current price of the stock is now we will move on to the next value so next value the stock price is actually 3 which means 3 is still great than value number one which means we don't need to update this value number three but we will have to check that whether we are making any greater profit or not so again we will do three minus whatever this buy value is the buy value is one so three minus one so the pro current profit we make is actually two but the thing is two is actually less than four which means we can we don't need to update the profit we have made so far now again we will ignore this case we will move on to the next value so the next value the stock price is actually at six so stock price is now at six and now again we will do six minus one so six minus one uh, selling price would be actually five and because this is five and this profit is actually greater than whatever profit we have achieved so far so the current maximum profit we have made so far is five now again the stock price is at four so again the selling price on this day would be four and we don't need to update the buying price because the buying price is already at one which is lower than four and now we will do four minus one so four minus one if we do we still make profit but this profit is only three dollars and three dollars is actually less than whatever the maximum profit we have made so far now we are at the end of our loop and now we don't have any more values to iterate over inside the given array which means whatever the result we have star stored inside the maximum profit variable we will just return that and in this case we will return answer as 5 and this answer would work perfectly fine this is like the most desired answer we need if we see the time and space complexity in this case the time complexity is actually big O of n why big O of n because notice that we are on completing everything in a single iteration and uh, in terms of space complexity uh, for the space complexity we are not actually using any additional space apart from storing couple of variables so that's why space is also constant so that's why this is a very good approach we are solving this in big O of n and big O, big o of n time and big O of 1 space complexity. So first of all we are going to initialize a variable called min and we are going to give it the first value of the given price this uh, we are going to create a variable called profit to note down the maximum profit we can achieve and initially we are going to mark it as zero and then we will update the value inside our loop. So now we are going to run a for loop across the given array. 
now inside the given loop first of all we will check that whether we need to update the value of min or not so we will check that if the current min value is less than whatever the value of i is then we will update the value of min and also we will check that whether the current profit we can make by selling the stock on that particular day comparing with the min value uh, we will choose the maximum profit we can and once this loop ends we simply need to return the whatever value we have stored in the profit variable let's try to run this code okay seems like our code is working as expected let's submit it and our code is actually pretty efficient it runs faster than a lot of other solutions and i would be posting this code in the comments so you can check it out from there thank you today we are going to do contains duplicate lead code problem and if we see some of the companies where i want to work at who have already asked this question there are companies like amazon adobe apple google microsoft facebook bloomberg uber yahoo and airbnb have already asked this question so that's why i am paying my utmost attention i hope you also enjoy the video so this is a lead code easy problem and basically we are given an integer array called nums and we need to check that whether this nums contains any duplicate values or not if it contains the duplicate values we need to return true if the, it does not contain a duplicate value we need to return false so let's try to understand this with couple of examples so in the first example over here we are given four values inside this array 1 2 3 and 1 we can see that this number 1 actually appears twice which means that there contains a duplicate so in this case we will return true uh, if we takes another example in the second input we are given four distinct value 1 2 3 4 and all the values are distinct so that's why there is no there are no duplicate entry so in this case we can return false let's see that what would be the different approaches to solve this problem uh suppose we are given an example that looks like this now in the brute force what we are going to do is we are going to compare every single value with all the other values that are present inside this given array so first of all we will take this value number 1 and we will see that in the rest of the remaining array does one appear again or not if it does not appear then we will move on to the next value and again we will repeat the same process so first of all we will take this value number 1 now this uh, all these four values they are not one which means we can define that one does not appear any time in this given array uh, now we check for this value number 2 Uh, for the value number 2 if we check over here these two are not two but this is actually a true so the moment we identify that there exists a value that we are already searching for uh, if that is present inside this given array we can return true immediately as yes, that yes uh, this input contains duplicates and this would be the answer in this case this brute force solution works as expected but uh, if we see the time and space complexity in this case the time complexity is actually going to be big o of n square why n square because for every single element we will have to compare all the other remaining elements and then again we will repeat the same process for uh, all the remaining characters which means that uh, the time complexity becomes big o of n square so let's see that how can we improve upon that now one way to improve our brute force solution is by using sorting let's try to understand this with an example suppose we take this input and we create a sorted input we will get a sorted array that looks like this Now inside the sorted array, all we will have to do is just compare any two adjacent values. So first of all, we compare this one with this value number two. They are both not same, which means we can ignore this case. Now we compare this two with this next value, which is also two. Which means because these two are same, we can determine that there exists a duplicate in this case, and we can return true immediately. So if we see the time complexity in this case, the time complexity is actually going to be big O of n log n. Why n log n? Because we will have to convert this nums to the sorted array, and that took that takes n log n time. after doing this uh, checking that whether it contains the duplicate or not only takes big o of n time but the thing is uh, this we generically we can write this as big o of n log n and if we see this uh, time complexity this is a much bigger improvement than our brute force approach which which had the time complexity of big o of n square but let's see that whether we can do anything better with this and whether we can find an optimal solution for this one as well now for the optimal solution what we are going to do is we are actually going to use an additional data structure and in terms of additional data structure we are going to use a hash set now the idea is that first of all we will check that uh, any value we are iterating over in this given input if that is already present inside this hash set or not if it is present we can return true immediately if it is not present we will add that entry to the hash set and then we will start uh, iterating over the next element with the same procedure so let's see that in action first of all we will check for this value number 1 so 1 is not present inside 
inside the hash set so we will add an entry called one over here now we are at this position number two two is again not present inside this hash set so we will add an entry called two over here uh, three and four both are not present so again we will add entry for three and four over here now again we are at this value number two now uh, when we check that whether it contains inside the hash set or not we can immediately say that it exists inside the hash set because we are already have an entry over here and we can do this in constant time because hash set the finding operation takes big o of one time or constant time so that's why it is it becomes really efficient for us so in this case we can return true immediately that hey we are at the position where we where this array contains the duplicate value uh, and somehow if we reach to the end of this uh, array and we don't find any duplicate entries inside this our hash set then we can return false in that case as well so if we see the time and space complexity in this case the time complexity is actually going to be big o of n only because we have to iterate this given input once nothing more than that if we see the space complexity in this case the space complexity is actually going to be big o of n as well because we have to create an additional data structure hash set where we will store all the elements that are present inside this given input first of all we are going to create a hash set called visited now we are going to iterate over this given input nums so inside our for loop first of all we are going to check that the value we are visiting if that is present inside our visited hash set or not if it is present which means we can return true immediately that there exists a duplicate if it is not present we will add an entry to our hash set in any case if we get out of the loop uh, we can determine that we did not find any duplicate when entries and we can return false in this case now let's try to run this code okay seems like our code is working as expected let's submit this code and our code runs pretty efficiently compared to a lot of other solution i would be posting this in the comments so you can check it out from there thank you today we are going to do product of an array except self lead code problem if we see some of the companies where I want to get a job who have already asked this question, there are companies like Amazon, Microsoft, Facebook, Apple, Uber, Bloomberg, Lyft, Google, Goldman Sachs, IBM, Twitter, TikTok and LinkedIn. So that's why I am paying my utmost attention. I hope you also enjoy the video. This is a lead code medium problem and also very well like problems on lead code. Uh, basically, we are given an integer array called nums and we need to return a new array called answer array such that every single value of that particular index position inside this answer array is actually equal to the product of all the other values that are present inside this given nums array except that particular ith element. So suppose we are given an input array that looks like this. In this case we will have to create an answer array for the answer and that would be of the same size of whatever this input array we are given now in this answer array suppose we want to enter the value at this uh, second position or uh, corresponding to the second index value what we are going to do is we are actually going to take the product of this value number one three and four and whatever the product of these three values are we will actually put it as the answer for this value same thing we are going to do for this uh, next value where we are going to take products of these two elements and this element but we won't take the product of this element from this original given input array and whatever the answer is we will actually put it over here inside the answer array uh, in order to enter this first element we will actually have to do the product of these three values so in the product of these three values is going to be 24 uh, now for the second element we will have to do the product of this first element and this last two elements so that is going to be 12 uh, for this third and fourth element we will uh, again repeat the same process and we will get subsequent values like 8 and 6 by doing the corresponding products and at the end we will have to return this as the answer array and uh, basically this is what the problem is asking us to do uh, even the name is also self explanatory that we need to return the product of an array except self but we are given a very specific declaration over here that we need to use it in big O of n time without using the division operator and why is asking us to use uh, solve this problem without using division operator because if we were allowed to use division operator suppose we are given an input we can just do the product of all of these value and we will get an answer called 24 and then all we have to do is for this answer array we will take this value 24 and then we will iterate over this input array and start dividing it with this 24 so even in the answer we will get if we divide 24 by 1 we will get the value as 24 if we divide 24 by 2 we will get value 12 if we divide 24 by 3 we will get value 8 so so on and so forth so it would become very easy for us to solve this problem so that is why they are explicitly asking us that we should not be using the division operator
Now the most basic brute force way to solve this problem is actually we take any single value and then we iterate over all the remaining values and do its product and put it in the answer array. So we will create an answer array that looks like this. We will first take this value. So we will iterate over this given nums array and for all these three values we will do its product and we will get the value as 24. Now again we will repeat the same process but this time we will be iterating over the second element. So because we are iterating over the second element we will take this first value and we will take these two values and we will do that sum so we will get value number 12 and again we will repeat the same process so essentially this is bound to give us the correct answer and we would get it in this case but thing is this is this would not be the correct way why because if we see the time complexity in this case the time complexity is actually going to be big o of n square why n square because we will have to iterate over this array for every single character we will have to iterate once and even for any particular character we will have to iterate over all of the other values again just to find their product number and that takes n square time and we are explicitly told that we will have to solve this problem in big o of n time so let's see that what would be the way to achieve that okay so now for the better approach we will actually have to put down one intuition to use and the intuition is suppose this is the element we want to get the product for in the answer array so the idea is that we are actually going to take the product value of first two elements and we will take the product of this uh, last element again if we take this portion this value number two we will take the product of all the elements that are present on the left of this value number two and we will take the product of all the elements that are present on the right of this product number uh, this value number two so that is the idea that for every single location we will have to take product of all the values that are behind or pre to that particular level so we can call it as prefix and all the values that come after that value and we can call it postfix so now the idea becomes quite simple what we are going to do is we are going to have two uh, arrays called prefix and postfix and we are going to iterate over this nums array once and for every single position we are actually going to keep track of all the values that come before it and after it and we are going to put down their error, uh, values uh, like their product values and at the end we will just do a multiplication between this pre and post arrays and then we will uh, we should get our answer so let's see that in action and also one more thing that because for this particular element that are at the edges uh, so for this value number four there is nothing on the right side so like we can't do anything but uh, for the simplicity purposes we will consider that anything on the right side is actually 1 because anything multiplied by 1 remains the same and same thing we are going to do for this left edge as well that because for this value number 1 there is nothing in the prefix so again by default we will treat this as value number 1 as well so that will help us in uh, doing some counting right so let's see that in action so first of all for this value number one uh, we, were, we are calculating the prefix values so this one actually has nothing on the left but it only has one so we'll do one times one and we'll get the answer as one now for this value number two actually all we need to do is whatever the left element is we we just need to do the product of all of them so the left element in this case is only one and we will just put it over here as well now in this case the uh, value number three we will have to do product of all these elements so one way to do it is to do this like one times two so do the product of all the these two elements but that is actually time consuming one better way to do it is that uh, if we take this particular element value number two this already contains the product of all the values that are be present before that so why are we doing the effort of doing the product of this value number one and two that is just costing us additional resources the better approach is that we for this value number three uh, we are over at this position all we have to do is we just take whatever the value we have stored over here which is the prefix of all the values before this value number two multiply by whatever this value is present and that would be the prefix sum for this value number three so what we are going to do in this case is we will take this value number two so we will take this value number two and we will take this value number one from here from the prefix array that we have already calculated and we will do two times one in this case we will get value as two so we will add two over here and again for this value number four again we are going to repeat the same process so now this time we are going to take the value before four that is three so we will take three and we will multiply it by whatever value we have already found in this prefix array which is two so three times two is actually going to be six and so now we are done with this prefix array again we are going to repeat the same thing for the postfix array so this is the edge value so we can simply do four times one so we'll add the value four directly over here now this is value number three for this value number three all we will have to do is just take product of this value so this is already four so we will again add four over here 
now uh, for this value number two all we have to do is we will take the value this uh, whatever value that is present over here three multiply by whatever value we have already calculated in the post fix over here which is 12 so we will have a value called 12 over here for this uh, element number two and now again for this element number one we are going to repeat the same process so we will take this two and multiply it by whatever value we have calculated inside our post fix array and this is going to be two times 12 okay now we are done with both of our arrays now the task is actually quite simple now we will create our answer array and we are going to simply do the multiplication of every single one of these values so this becomes 24 times 1 24 this becomes 12 this becomes 8 and this becomes oh i made a mistake over here this has to be 1 not 4 because we are actually doing uh, the multiplication of all the elements that are present uh, on the right side of this value so this would become 6 and this is the solution that we are we, we are going to do uh, this solution actually works perfectly fine there are no issues with that if we see the time and say space complexity in this case the time complexity is actually going to be big O of uh, 3 times n why 3 times n because we will have to iterate over this n to first of all create this prefix array then we get, we have to iterate over n times to create this postfix array and then again we will have to iterate over both of them to create this answer array so we are doing like 3 times n work but in general we can write this as big O of n and in terms of space complexity uh, we are actually creating couple of arrays so we also have to do big O of n as space complexity so the idea is can we do something better and the answer is yes there is one way to actually do this both prefix and postfix array in a single array and that too inside the answer array that we are planning to create okay so let's keep the same example and we want to find the optimal solution for this one well the idea is that rather than doing two separate prefix and postfix arrays we are actually going to create an answer array and we are going to add all the values and now we are going to do prefix and postfix multiplication inside the same answer array and let me quickly show you how uh, first of all we are going to use couple of variables called prefix and postfix so let me uh, add their values and by default they are going to have value as one now what we are going to do is uh, first of all we are going to iterate over this given input uh, nums and we are going to calculate the prefix for every single element inside this answer array and we are also going to update the value inside this pre function uh, or pre variable and then again we will uh, iterate in the reverse order and we will keep on updating the postfix values inside the answer and by the time we are done uh, our answer array should have been completely filled out let me quickly show you that in the action so first of all uh, for this value number one uh, this is actually the prefix of uh, every every value that is present behind this one and uh, the multiplication of all of those values so because there is nothing over here we can consider this to be one by default so i'll not write it over here i'll just write over here that uh, for this first element inside this answer array uh, the nums actually does not have anything on the left side side left side so we can consider this to be one now we are going to uh, we are at this po second position for the second position what we are going to do is we are going to take the multiplication of whatever the value we have on the left side right so even on the left side we only have value one and even the prefix value is also one so far uh, by default so we are going to add one over here again now we are at this value number two or uh, three so for this value number three what we are going to do is we are actually going to take the the value that is before that which is two and we are going to multiply it with whatever the pre variable we have so we were also doing the same thing for this value number two as well but because both the values are one we were not getting any other result but in this case we will actually get a result of two and because we are getting a result of two the result of pre is also updated also being updated to value number two um, because it will help us to know further down for the next elements that what is the value of prefix now we are at this value number four so again we are going to repeat the same process we will take this value number three and we will take whatever the value of this prefix we have which is two so three times two uh, the value six so we will add value six over here okay and now we are done filling up this prefix portion and we have taken the prefix of every single element inside this answer array now we are going to do the reverse order now inside the reverse order again for this value number four actually uh, there is nothing on the right side of this value number four which means there is nothing on the postfix so we can consider it as one now because this is already one what we are going to do is whatever value we have calculated so far we are going to multiply it so if we multiply six by one the answer we get is six okay so so far uh, for this value number four the answer is six now we are at this value number three for this value number three what we are going to do is we will have to calculate everything on the postfix side so this value is four so we are take, going to take value four multiply by whatever value of this postfix variable we have which is one so four times one becomes one 
so now we have the value as 4 for this postfix so we are going to update the value of the postfix to be 4 and we are also going to uh, multiply this 4 with whatever the value we already calculated for this value number 3 which is 2 so 4 times 2 is going to be 8 and this is going to be answer for this value number 3 that or uh, this is the product of all the numbers for this value number 3 except itself now we are at this value number 2 for value number 2 we are going to take value number 3 multiplied by whatever the post variable we have post variable is actually 4 so 3 times 4 is actually 12 so we are going to update that value over here first of all so now we have the value 12 over here and we will have to take this 12 and multiply it with whatever value we have already stored over here which is 1 so 1 times 12 is also 12 and now again we are at this last position so again for the last position we are going to repeat the same process we will take whatever the value that is after this value number 1 which is 2 so we will take this 2 we will multiply it with whatever value we have stored inside this post variable which is again 12 so 2 times 12 and we this becomes actually 24 so we will do 24 and we will take 24 multiply by whatever value we have already stored inside this answer array which is 1 so 24 times 1 becomes 24 and this is the answer and if you look closely this actually becomes the complete answer that we are looking for and we have actually done everything in place without using any additional data structure or any additional array and we don't have to use basically any extra space so this is the best way to approach this problem and this is the solution that any interviewer would want to see if we see the time complexity in this case the time complexity is actually going to be big o of 2n why 2n because first of all we are iterating over from uh, left to right calculating this pre variable and then we are iterating on the reverse order calculating this post variable and updating the values but still which is good if we see the space complexity in this case Oh, well space complexity is actually constant because we are not using any additional space for this answer array we are given inside this uh, qu question statement that we have to create a new array so that we are anyways going to create but apart from that we are only using couple of variables to store some data and uh, that's why this is a very good approach now let's move on to coding so well, we are going to create a new array called result and by default we are going to set all the values as one we are going to initialize the two variable called prefix and postfix and we are going to assign the value as 1 for both of them. Okay, now we are going to run our first for loop to iterate from left to right and we are going to update the value of prefix inside our answer uh, array. So first of all, we are going to update the value inside our result array. And then we are going to update the value of our prefix variable. So after this loop ends, basically we should have uh, prefix values filled out for every single position inside our result array. Now we are going to run another loop and we are going to come in the reverse order. And first of all, we are going to update the value inside the result array. So any single value inside the result is actually going to be multiplication of whatever the value we already had. Multiply by postfix variable. We also have to update the value of postfix variable. We are good to go. Oh, actually I made a mistake. This should be pre only, not prefix. Okay. And after this second loop ends, essentially our result error should have been populated. So we can simply return that. Let's try to run this code. Okay. Seems like our solution is working as expected. Let's submit this code. And our code runs pretty efficiently compared to a lot of other solutions. So that's why this is really good approach. I would be posting the solution in the comments so you can check it out from there. Thank you. Today we are going to do maximum sub array lead code problem. And if we see some of the companies where I want to get a job who have already asked this question, there are companies like LinkedIn, Amazon, Apple, Microsoft, Google, Adobe, Facebook, Bloomberg, Uber, ByteDance, Yahoo, eBay, and Splunk. So that's why I'm paying my utmost attention. I hope you also enjoy the video. So this is a lead code medium problem and very well like problem on lead code. Basically, we are given an array called nums and we need to find a continuous sub array which has the largest sum and then return the sum value. We are also told that a sub array is a continuous part of any array. So we are given the definition of it. Now let's try to understand this with an example. So suppose this is the example we are given. Well, I have actually drawn this example uh, in much bigger format over here. 
so for this example what we are going to do is we are going to see different uh, sub arrays and then we are going to see that what is the maximum uh, sum we have uh, we are able to find so far and then in the end we will return whatever the maximum sum we have found so first of all this value is actually negative 2 so because this value is negative 2 even if all the remaining values they are positive it makes no sense for us to keep this value so we are going to ignore this value and we are not going to keep it in our uh, current sub array now this value is positive 1 so that is good but again combination of these two is actually minus 2 so again we cannot keep this in the uh, our uh, continuous sub array well now this value is actually positive 4 and which is good sign now these two value this is again still positive 3 which is also a good sign and the combination of these three is again 5 and then we add this value so this becomes 6 and we are going to keep on updating the max value as well so max value so far we have found so far is 6 that we can say that up until this point the sub array there where we have found the maximum value to be is 6 now this is again minus 5 so the, if we do 6 plus minus 5 we still get positive 1 value which is again positive so we are keeping this as a sub array and then again this value is plus 4 so plus 4 plus 1 becomes plus 5 so this is also positive but the thing is uh, in the end up until this point the maximum value we were able to find is 6 so because it was 6 we are going to return 6 as the answer this is what the problem is asking us to do we need to find the sum of maximum sub array and then return that value so let's see what would be different approaches to solve this problem basically we need to find the maximum sub array what we can do is we will try to find every single possible sub array try to see the sum of all of those characters and whichever possess the maximum sum we simply return that sum so let's see that in action so first of all what we are going to do is we are going to take some of this character then we are going to take some of these two characters then we are going to take some of these three characters and so on and so forth we are keep on repeating the process with this first element after we are done with this essentially we are going to get rid of this first element and now whatever the remaining elements are we are going to start taking some of those values so in this case what again we are going to do is we will take this element then again we will take these two elements and again we will take these three elements and overall we will keep on making the sum and eventually we would find the answer and the answer in this case is going to be the sum of these three characters and whatever the answer is we can simply return that so this approach would work as, as expected but the issue with this brute force solution is actually that we are doing a lot of repetitive work if we see the time complexity in this case the time complexity is actually going to be big o of n square so let's see that what would be the better way to solve this before we come up with the optimal solution first of all let's make a couple of things very clear uh, what is our aim and what is the thing that we are trying to find well basically we are trying to find that what is the maximum sum sub array at any given moment there can be any current sub array that we are iterating over which could be the maximum sub error could not be the maximum sub array we don't know but at any given moment we will have need to have the ability to keep track of some of all the characters that are present in that particular sub array so which means that we are going to have a variable called current or current sub array where we are going to keep track of the sum of all the current variables that we are we have iterated over and we are keeping track of uh, well second thing is that we need to find the maximum sub array and amongst any of the sub arrays any one could be the maximum sub array so we are also going to keep track of another variable called maximum sub array where we are going to keep track of maximum current sum we have found so far so well these two things are understandable right uh, they are from programming perspective but there is also one more thing that is actually rational and the rational thing is that at any given moment suppose this value is actually minus 3 so current sum, sum or current sub array we have found is actually minus 3 so if this value is minus 3 because this value is negative so if this value is negative even though all the remaining values they are positive and they keep on increasing the value in size this minus 3 is always going to have to cause them to have a lesser value so if that is the case why are we even bothering to keeping this value at our bay or at our disposal so the idea is at any given moment for our current sub array the moment we would identify that the current value or some set of current values they are causing it to have a negative value if that is the case we are going to immediately update our current sub array and then we will keep on moving towards the next values and based on these two logics uh, all we are going to do is we are going to iterate over our given array and keep on going to updating the current sub array and then keep on updating the maximum sub array we have found so far and in the end we should be able to find the answer so let's see that traversal in action before we start iterating over this array we are going to define some default values for this current and maximum variable the default value for current 
current is going to be the zero and for maximum it's going to be whatever the first element of this given array is which is minus three that is to cover an edge case where we are only given one element now let's start iterating over okay so now uh, the sum of these two elements is actually going to be minus 3 plus 2 so minus 3 plus 2 is actually going to be minus 1 which is still less than 0 so because this is less than 0 we are not going to update our current max variable and the maximum sum we are actually able to find so far is going to be 0 which is there are definitely greater than minus 3 now again the for these three variables again the sum is going to be negative so we are not going to do anything and we are going to ignore all three of these cases now this value is actually positive so because this value is positive the current sum we have is going to be 8 so which means we will have to update the maximum sum we have, we have found so far to be the value 8 as well now again we add the sum of these two values so 8 plus minus 1 so 8 plus minus 1 actually becomes 7 so this becomes 7 which is less than whatever the maximum value we have found so far so we don't need to update the max variable now we again add this value to our current sum so 7 plus 2 7 plus 2 is 9 9 is greater than whatever the maximum value we had so this becomes 9 okay now again this is also a positive value 3 so we can do 9 plus 3 which becomes 12 so we are again going to add the value 12 to our maximum sum that we have we have been able to find so far and then this value is actually negative 5 so we can do 12 plus minus 5 so 12 plus minus 5 is going to be 7 and again because this value is still positive we are keeping this current sub array going on because we we don't know future values might be positive values and this can also go up pretty quickly now uh, we are we have actually reached to the end of this uh, array and we don't have any more elements to go over so the maximum sum we have found so far is 12 and this is what we need to return as the answer in this case uh, and so this is the most optimal approach to solve this problem if we see time and space complexity in this case the time complexity is actually going to be big of n why big of n because we will have to iterate over every single array um, or every single value that is present inside this given array which takes big of n time if we see space complexity in this case the space complexity is actually big O of one or constant space because apart from storing these couple of variables we are not using any additional space so that's why space complexity is very minimal first of all we are going to initialize two variable called current sum and uh, maximum sum for current sum we are going to initialize the value to be zero and for maximum sum we are going to initialize the value to be the first value inside this given nums array we are going to create a for loop to iterate over this given array now we are going to check that whether the current sum if that is less than 0 or not if that is less than 0 we are going to update the value of current sum to 0 that is not the case we are going to calculate the value for current sum and maximum sum so current sum is going to be current sum plus whatever the current uh, value inside this in the given nums array we have and we will have to check that whether the current sum we have created if that is the maximum sum or not and after loop ends, we simply have to return maximum sum. Let's try to run this code. Seems like our solution is working as expected. Let's submit this code. And our code runs pretty efficiently. I would be posting this in the comments so you can check it out from there. Thank you. Today we are going to do maximum product sub array. This is a very popular problem on lead code. And if we see some of the companies where I want to get a job who have already asked this question, there are companies like Amazon, LinkedIn, Microsoft, Google, Apple, Bloomberg, Facebook, and Uber. So that's why I'm paying my utmost attention. I hope you also enjoy the video. Okay, so this is a lead code medium problem, and as mentioned, a very well liked problem on lead code. Basically, we are given an integer array called nums. And we need to find a continuous non-empty sub-array that has the largest product and we need to return the product. Uh, we are also given the definition that what a sub-array is that is basically a continuous sequence inside the any given array. And let's try to understand this problem with, the, with an example. So I have broadened this example over here and basically we are trying to find the maximum product sub-array. So a sub-array that contains the maximum product. In this case, this is a negative value and that changes the dynamic equation. So in this case, the product of these two elements, th that is a sub-array, is actually going to be 6. And all the other sub-arrays, they are always going to have lesser values than 6. So in this case, as the answer, we need to return 6 that that is the maximum product sub-array we can make for this given input array. And this is what the problem is asking us to do. So first, let's see that what is going to be the brute force way to solve this problem. 
well the brute force way to solve this problem is that we are asked to find the maximum product sub array right so if we are asked to find something of a sub array why don't we check every single sub array see that what is the product we can make and find the maximum amongst that so like do the baby steps so what we are going to do is we are going to keep on iterating over every single sub array that we can make uh, we are going to see that uh, we are going to have a variable called answer and uh, in the answer we are only going to store the maximum value we have found so far and then we will keep on repeating the same process for all the remaining sub arrays and eventually we would find a pair that contains the maximum product sub array and in this case the answer is actually going to be this 6 times 7 that is 42 and we will have 42 populated as the answer eventually so the brute force way is a very trivial way but it leads to the correct solution so if you are only looking for a solution you will get it using brute force but what are the issues with this one well the issues clearly we can see over here that we will have to iterate over every single sub array that is there and that would lead us to have a time complexity of big O of n square so which is ba very bad because for every single element uh, we will have to iterate over every other elements and then keep on repeating the same process so the idea is to see that can we find something of a better time complexity we can actually achieve that using the most important concept inside our computer programming and that is called dynamic programming using the dynamic pro programming we are basically going to have two pointers to store some critical important results and that is going to lead us to find the maximum product sub array so first let's understand one thing regarding what is being asked we are trying to find the product now we know that for the product suppose if all the integers are just positive integers then basically it is the product of all the integers that we need to return right but the thing is that is not always the case we could encounter negative integers and the negative integers leads to very uh, interesting results the interesting results are that first of all we suppose in this case uh, these three values if we do product of them okay the product of these two is 6 and the 6 times minus 3 leads us to minus 18 to be the product over here right the thing is now this value seems very low value because of the negative value but imagine that over here rather than this 4 being positive if we had a negative 4 then that is actually going to lead us to have a very beautiful result that if we do minus 18 times minus 4 the answer is going to be plus 72 and that is going to be the maximum product sub array so you see what i'm trying to say the moment we encountered a negative value immediately we found it to have the minimum value but that negative value lead us to have some better consequential results in the future so we don't know that whether we whenever we encounter a negative value we don't know whether we should keep it or not so that is a tricky part that is why we are going to use dynamic programming and we are actually going to use two pointers and these two pointers are going to be that at any given position we are at inside our array we are going to see that up until this point what is the minimum value we have been able to achieve and what is the maximum value we have been able to achieve or basically what i'm trying to say is what is the minimum product we have been able to achieve and what is the maximum product we have been able to achieve and every single value we could have three possibilities so let me clean this up a bit at every single value we are at there could be three possibilities either this value could be part of a sub array that leads us to have the maximum product or it could have been a part of a sub array that leads us to have the least value up until this point or this could be the start of a new sub array that leads us to have a maximum product in the future the idea is at any given position we are going to check three things and the three things we are going to check is that up until this point whatever the minimum value we had which is which we have stored so far we are going to multiply this value with this minimum value we are also going to multiply this value with whatever the maximum value we have able we have been able to store so far and we are also going to compare this value by itself so we have basically three values at any given position the value with the previous minimum value the value with the previous maximum value and the value by itself and uh, for all of these three values we are going to see that what is the minimum value we are able to make we will store that 
what is the maximum value we, be, we are able to make amongst these three values we will store that as well and eventually we would reach to the end of our loop with the maximum value we have been able to generate and we will have a parameter called uh, answer and in the answer parameter whenever we identify a better maximum value we would populate that so this is the approach i am suggesting now let me try to go over an, exa an example okay so suppose this is the example we are have and now let's try to use dynamic programming in this case with two pointers so we are going to create two pointers called min and max and for every single value we are going to compare it with three values that we are going to compare it with and we are going to populate these results we are also going to have a variable called answer we will update it based on the maximum value we have found so far okay so first value is five so we offer all the three values we only have five we can't compare any with it, anything okay so the minimum value we have found so far is going to be five maximum is also going to be five and that's it now this next value is three okay so now let's see that what are three values that we have to compare so first value is three by itself next value is three times the minimum value so three times five next value is three times maximum value so again three times five so the three values we have is three fifteen and fifteen okay so now the minimum value amongst these three is going to be three so we are going to populate that and the maximum value is going to be 15 so we are again going to populate that the answer so far that the best we have received is 15 so we are going to populate that okay now let's get rid of this one now again we are at the next element that is one so now the three values we have is one one times whatever the minimum value so that is three so the value is going to be three and the one times the maximum value that is 15 okay now amongst these three values the minimum value we can able to make is going to be one okay so let's populate that and the maximum value is going to be 15 the answer is going to remain the same now let's clean this up okay now things become interesting when we reach to this value nine minus two okay now the three values we have is going to be minus two by itself then minus two times the minimum previous minimum value so previous minimum value in this case is one so minus two times one is going to be minus two and the previous maximum value so previous maximum value in this case is 15 so minus two times 15 is going to be minus 30 okay now these are the three values we have and now we are going to see that what is the minimum and maximum value we are able to generate right so currently the minimum value we are able to generate is going to be minus 30 so we are going to store that over here okay and the maximum value we are able to generate in this case is going to be minus two so we are going to store that over here okay now we are good up until this point now this value is zero so the three values that we have to compare is going to be zero zero times the minimum value so that is again going to be the zero and zero times maximum value that is again going to be the zero so all three values are zero so let's put zeros over here now again uh, we are at this value number negative five so now the three values that we have to compare is going to be negative five and then both of these are zero so it's going to be zero zero again so currently the maximum value we are able to generate is going to be the zero so we are again going to populate the value with zero and the minimum value we are able to generate is negative five so we are going to populate the value with negative five now the next value is eight okay so now the three values we have to compare is eight eight times negative five is going to be negative 40 and eight times uh, the zero is going to be zero okay now uh, the three values that we have let's compare them and let's find the minimum value so minimum value in this case is going to be negative 40 so we are going to put it over here the maximum value we are going to have is 8 so let's populate that over here okay now we are at this value number minus 3 so with this minus 3 we again we have three options so minus 3 and then minus 3 times this minus 40 that leads us to positive 120 and minus 3 times 8 that leads us to minus 24 okay so now in this case the minimum value we have so far is going to be minus 24 which is this one and the maximum value we are going to have is going to be 120 and this 120 is greater than this value number 15 so we are also going to update that in our answer and now we have reached to the end of our array so end of our dynamic programming journey so we'll stop here and whatever value we have found in the answer we are going to return this as the answer so in this case answer is 120 that is the correct answer if we see and if we compare this to our brute force well essentially because we are using the beautiful concept of dynamic programming we are completely everything in just one single iteration and all we are doing is just storing couple of variables uh, to store the previously calculated results and comparing different values and that leads us to have the correct answer and find the maximum product subarray in a single iteration which is wonderful 
if we see time complexity in this case the time complexity is, is, is actually going to be big O of n and the space complexity is actually going to be big O of constant space complexity because apart from storing couple of variables we are not storing any other data so this is a very good time and space complexity to have compared to our brute force approach that had the time complexity of big O of n square which was very bad So first let's take care of some edge cases that if the given number is empty we can simply return 0. So now we will initialize a min variable, a max variable and a result variable. Okay so now let's run a for loop to iterate over our given nums array. Let's initialize a variable called current to keep track of the current variable we are at. Okay now we will have to calculate max and min value. So first let's calculate max value. So this takes care of comparing three values for our max variable. And we are using math.max function two times uh, because that is the way to do it. I think in Python you can do it just without using like two math.max functions. Now let's calculate our min value as well. The thing is for our min value we will also have to use the max value. But since previously we have already calculated our max value it makes no sense for us to use that over here. So what I am going to do is I am going to create a temporary variable and this temporary variable I am going to calculate the max value then for the calculation of min value basically i am going to use the previous uh, max variable now because this is the temporary variable we will assign this value to max we will also have to keep on updating our result variable as well that's it uh, basically when the loop ends we should have our answer populated in the result variable so let's return that now let's try to run this code okay seems like our solution is working as expected let's submit this code and our code runs pretty efficiently compared to a lot of other solutions and uh, I would be posting this solution in the comments so you can check it out from there. Today we are going to do find minimum in a rotated sorted array and if we see some of the companies where I want to get a job who already asked this question there are companies like Microsoft, Amazon, Uber, Facebook, Apple, Bloomberg, Google and TikTok. So that's why I am paying my utmost attention. I hope you also enjoy the video. So this is a lead code medium problem and basically we need to find the minimum inside a rotated sorted array. Now you will ask that what does a rotated sorted array means. We are actually given some definition of what a rotated sorted array is. If you want you can iterate over this definition. But the thing is let me quickly show it to you by an example. Basically we are originally given a sorted array. Now for this sorted array if we take the rightmost element and put it on the leftmost position and all the other subsequent elements we flip it one side on the right side we can determine this to be rotated one time. So if I take this original sorted array and if I rotate one time so one time rotated array is going to look like this. You can see that this 5 that was originally at the rightmost position has been flipped to the leftmost position and all the other values we put shifted them one position on the right. Now if I uh, rotate this one more time so eventually I would rot I would have rotated this array to two times basically the result I would get is going to look like this there where the first two values are 4 and 5 and then we have 1, 2 and 3. Now over here this 4 that was originally over here that came to this place. Now we can rotate it like 3 times, 4 times as many times as we want like we can only rotate it up until 5, uh, five times because there are only 5 elements. Now. Uh, basically in any rotated array we need to find that what is the minimum value that is present in it. So if we try to understand this with an example over here we are given some array uh, where the original version of array was 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 that got rotated 3 times and we were given this as the input. Now if we see the minimum value in this case is 1 so we need to return 1 as the answer. We are also given one key important detail that we have to find that we must write an algorithm that runs in big O of log n time. So that is the key part. First let's see that what is going to be the brute force approach to solve this problem. Well the brute force approach that comes to our mind is that why don't we start iterating over the given array. We have a variable called min or answer or whatever you want to call it and then uh, we start iterating over all the subsequent elements one at a time and whenever we find a lower value basically we update that in the min variable. So eventually when we start iterating, when we would have completed iteration, we would find the value 1 to be the lowest value that we can find inside this array and that we are going to return as the answer. 
this solution leads us to the correct answer there are no issues with this one but why this brute, sol brute force solution does not work in your interview or uh, interview or anywhere else is because this solution actually happens in big o of n time because we are iterating over all the L n elements and we were explicitly told that we need to solve this problem in big o of log n time so that's why this brute force solution won't work now whenever we see log n solution immediate thing that comes to our mind is that we are going to use binary search right and that is true that we are going to use binary search in this case but before we do that let's make some logic clear Well, the key part of the logic we have is that if we compare the left and right element for any given array, if the array is completely sorted, which is the case in uh, over here, that the entire array has been completely sorted, there are no mismatching pairs, right? So because this array is completely sorted, if we compare the leftmost element and rightmost element or any element with its left element, uh, basically we would find that the value at the left element is always less than whatever value at the right element we have like if we compare these three variables and if we compare the right variable to be over here basically again in this case the right is three and left is one so we can conclude that this whole portion is sorted if we have the right variable located at this position uh, basically we we have the value of left to be 1 and right to be 5 again left is less than 1 so we can conclude that this whole portion is actually sorted so the lowest value or that we can achieve in this whole portion between this left and right is going to be whatever value that is located at the leftmost position now whenever we compare the left value and right value and we determine that left is actually greater than right if we find that left is actually greater than right we can determine that the minimum value exists somewhere between left and right we don't know that at what position minimum value exists but the thing is we need to achieve to the direction where we can actually find left is less than right because remember over here currently the value of left is 3 and value of right is 2 so in this case left is actually greater than 2 whenever we have to find the minimum value we will have to move in a direction where we will reach uh, to a conclusion where left is less than right and in order to achieve that what we are going to do is we are going to compare the value of the left to the middle uh, pointer that exists and depending on the value of the middle pointer we would determine that the minimum value if does it exist on the left side of the middle pointer or on the right side of the middle pointer and depending on that we will uh, update our value of left pointer or right pointer so let me show you with a broader example what I'm trying to say. So I have drawn a big example over here. And first let's uh, denote, assign our initial values of left and right, right? Uh, so we have the values of left and right set up for us. Now we know that we need to reach to a position where left is less than right. If that is the case, then we will have some interesting results, right? But currently, if we see the value of left is two and value of right is one, so left is actually greater than one so now we will have to move in some direction so now what we are going to do is we are going to find the mid value and also remember we are going to have an answer variable that is going to store the lowest value we have been able to find so far so currently the value of left is 2 value of right is 1 right so we are not going to do anything in the answer yet now we are going to find the middle pointer so the current middle pointer is going to be at position number 4 why because left position is 0 right position is 8 so 0 plus 8 is equal to 8 divided by 2 that gives us the middle value and middle value in this case is going to be the 4 right so the value that is located at the fourth position is 6 now we need to compare the values between left and mid left and mid if we compare left is 2 and mid is 6 so 2 is less than 6 now remember whenever we identify that the left value is less than whatever the value we compared we can dictate that every value in between is actually greater than the value of the left which means that no value amongst these values can be the answer or can be the minimum value because uh, remember we already know that on the right hand side the value is actually less than left and because of that we will have to update our migration on the right side and also remember whenever we compare the value of left value with the mid value whatever the lower value is we are going to store it so currently the lowest value we have been able to find is 2 so we are going to store 2 as the answer right now we are going to uh, switch our left pointer to go on the right side of the mid so now let me clean this up a bit so now this is going to be our new left pointer and this is going to be our new right pointer again we are going to compare the value of left and right so left is actually greater than right 
right? So now we will have to find the mid pointer. Mid pointer in this case is going to be left plus right divided by two. So the current value of left is five, right is eight. So 13 divided by two, if we put it uh, floor value, we will get the value of six. So six is going to be the middle pointer in this case. So now we have the six to be the middle pointer. Now we are going to compare left with the middle pointer. And now in this case, left is actually less than middle pointer, which means that answer cannot lie between left and middle pointer. And again, we will have to update the value of the left pointer. Also for this leftmost value, we will compare that whether we need to update the answer or not. So answer currently we had was two and this is seven. So we don't need to update the answer and we are good up until this point. Okay. Now again, we determine that this value is not the answer. Now our left pointer comes at this position our right pointer comes at this position. Again, we are going to compare the values of left and right. So currently left is actually less than right. And that is the ideal scenario that we found that left is like actually less than right, which means that now left is at the correct position to be the lowest position that it can be uh, before it iterates or it takes over right. And now because of this one, uh, we are going to update, uh, we are going to see that whether we need to update our answer or not. So current answer we had was two and because left was less than right, we are going to compare the left value with this answer value and uh, the left value is actually zero. So we are going to update the answer to be zero. And in this case, this is the correct answer that we are able to find and we are going to return that. Uh, let's try to understand the same thing with another example. So in this case, left is over here, right is over here. Currently, uh, left is actually greater than right. So because of that, we will have to find the middle value. So middle value is going to be this one. So now if we see currently the left is actually greater than middle value as well, which means we cannot determine that the left and middle portion is actually completely sorted. We can only determine that the middle and right portion is completely sorted. So in this case, we are actually going to update the value of the right pointer and we are going to determine that these are all the values that are not part of the answer. So we can just simply ignore them and we will not do anything for these values. So now currently our right pointer comes over here. Now, because of that, we are again going to repeat the same process and we will try to find the middle value. Middle value in this case is going to be eight, right? So we are going to compare left with the middle value. So left with the middle value, if we compare left is actually less than the middle value. If that is the case, we can determine that no value over here is the middle minimum value. So we can simply ignore that. And now our left value becomes this one. Our right value becomes this one. And now if we compare left is actually less than right, left is less than right. That is the ideal scenario that we were looking for, which means that now left is at the correct position where the value is actually minimum. And in the answer, we are going to denote the value to be zero. And that is going to be the answer we are going to return. Now, if we see time complexity in this case, the time complexity is actually going to be big O of log n because remember during any single iteration, we actually removed the half of the candidates that we are, we were trying to search for. And that is why we are actually using binary search in this program to solve this problem. And that is the logic we are going to use. Uh, and now let's move on to the coding. So first of all, we are going to initialize three variables, left, right, and answer. Now we are going to test for an edge case that if the nums array only has one element, basically we can return that as the answer. Okay, if that is not the case, we are going to run our while loop that while left is less than or equal to right. First, we are going to check that if the current left and right position makes the array completely sorted or not. And that can only happen if the value at number of left uh, is actually less than whatever the value of uh, nums at right we have. And if that is the case, we are going to see that whether we need to update our answer or not. If that is not the case, we will have to calculate the middle pointer. So first, we are going to initialize a value called mid and we are going to calculate the middle pointer. After calculating the mid pointer, we are again going to check that whether we need to update our answer or not. Now we are going to see that which way on the mid pointer do we need to take the jump. So if uh, we def if we find out that the current value of left is actually less than or equal to mid value, then we will have to update the value of left pointer to the right side of the mid. And if that is not the case, which means we will have to update our right pointer. Basically, that's all we have to do for our binary search operation. After this loop ends, we can simply return whatever we have stored in the answer. And now let's try to run this code. Okay, seems like our solution is working as expected. Let's submit this code. And our code is actually pretty fast compared to a lot of other solutions. And I would be actually posting the solution in the comments so you can check it out from there. 
Today we are going to do search in a rotated sorted array and if we see some of the companies where I want to get a job who have already asked this question there are companies like Amazon, Microsoft, Facebook, LinkedIn, Bloomberg, Apple, TikTok, ByteDance, Google, Goldman Sachs, Uber and eBay. So that's why I am paying my utmost attention. I hope you also enjoy the video. This is a lead code medium problem and also a very well liked problem on lead code. Basically we are trying to search an element inside a rotated sorted array. Now if you notice this is very similar to one of the previous videos we saw recently and you can check it out that over here. Now uh, we are basically given uh, an array called nums and we are also given a target value and we need to check that whether this target value exists inside this nums array or not. If it does we need to return the index of that target value. Now the special part about this question is that the nums array we are given is actually a sorted array that has been rotated certain times. So it sounds confusing at first that what does a rotated sorted array means. So you can either read this definition that has been provided over here but uh, let me make it a little bit clear for you. Uh, basically a rotated sorted array is that initially an array is a fully sorted array which is the case over here. You can see that all the elements are sorted and they are all in ascending order and the thing is whenever we rotate one time basically we take the rightmost element we put it on the leftmost side and then we flip all the elements one side or one position to the right and that is how we rotate and uh, rotate a sorted array. So if we consider this to be the original array, suppose we rotate it one time, we will get a result that looks like this, where this 5 that was originally on the rightmost position came on the leftmost position and all the other subsequent value we jumped it one step on the right side. If we rotate it two times, again the 4 and 5 would come on the left side and all the values would be shifted two times on the right side. If we rotate three times, basically all the values would uh, be rotated three times and we would get an array that looks like this. So the idea is we are given a form of a rotated sorted array. The thing is we don't know that how many times it has been rotated or what not. We are also given some target element and we need to see that whether this target element exists inside this array or not. So suppose uh, this is the array we are given as the input and we are given target is equal to uh, 3. If that is the case then in this case 3 exists inside this array and its index value is 0. So we need to return 0 as the answer. And this is what is being asked for this problem. So now let's see that what are going to be couple of different approaches to solve this problem. The first approach we have is a brute force approach. In the brute force approach what you can do is suppose this is the array we are given and we are given the target value to be 0. Well if we see uh, what we simply do is we start iterating over this array uh, one by one and every single time we iterate until we find the L value that exists. If the target value exists inside this array whatever its index position is which is 3 in this case we return that as the answer uh, and if we somehow reach to the end of this array and we do not find this target value we simply return that okay the target does not exist right. The thing is this solution is not the most optimal solution. Why? Because the time complexity for this solution is going to be big O of n. Meanwhile if we read the problem statement we are explicitly told that we need to complete this in big O of log n time complexity and this big O of n is just, just not good enough. Okay, before we come up with the optimal solution first let's understand a couple of concepts regarding the sorted arrays right. For the sorted arrays uh, if we compare any left element with any right element uh, if we end at any point identify that left is actually less than right and we know that this given array is a sorted array right and this left is actually less than uh, right. So if that is the case all the elements between this left and right will be sorted in ascending order. That is one of the properties of a sorted array. We already know that. Now uh, the tricky part we have is that the array we are given is actually rotated. So the thing is we will have to take care of this rotated part as well and we don't know that how many times it has been rotated. So suppose we are given an array like this. This has been rotated few times right. Now whenever we compare the left element with the right element initially uh, we can clearly see in this case that left is actually 3 and right is actually 2 which means left is actually greater than right. Uh, and remember we already know that when left is less than right we already know that all the elements in between they are actually sorted and if we are trying to find some target value that falls between this left value and this right value we can immediately find that target value. Suppose we are given the target value to be 3 we know that left value is 0 and right value is 5. 
so because of that this target value has to be somewhere between this 0 and 5 because it it can only exist between 0 and 5 because this portion is sorted 3 cannot be outside of the scope the thing is we cannot say that for certain in this case because over here currently if we see left is actually greater than right which means we can determine one thing that this whole portion is not sorted but the thing is we already know that a chunk of this portion is sorted which is this that 3 4 5 this is sorted in ascending order again same way this 0 1 2 that is also sorted in ascending order why because this was a rotated array right so the thing is what now we are going to do is we are trying to find some target value right so our aim is that suppose we are given the target value to be 4 right now we are trying to find the value 4 the thing is for this rotated array the idea we are going to use is that when we determine that left is actually greater than right which means that this whole portion is not sorted right that is the key part this whole portion is not sorted but some chunk of this portion has to be sorted and that we can determine by defining some middle value so in this case suppose we put down a middle value so suppose we have a middle value that is zero right now with this zero what we are going to do is we are actually going to compare this left with this middle value if we compare this left with this middle value left value is equal to three and middle value is equal to zero so if that is the case left is actually greater than middle value so since that is the case we are we won't be able to do much over here and uh, basically what we will do is now again we are going to compare this middle value with this right value so currently middle value is actually zero uh, the right value is actually two so middle value is actually less than right which means because this was the rotated array we can determine that all the values between this middle value and this right value is actually completely sorted this is the important property that we have to define that this whole portion is completely sorted because of that now we will see okay our target value is actually four uh, the current middle value is zero current right value is equal to two which means 4 does not fall between 0 and 2 because it does not fall between 0 and 2 we can concretely say that 4 cannot be part of this particular chain so immediately we can ignore all of these cases and now what we'll do is we will shift our right pointer to one step before mid why because we were certainly able to say that this sorted property of this rotated sorted array help us determine that 4 is not part of this one uh, all the elements between these portions were between 0 and 2 now uh, we are going to move our right pointer over here so let me clean this up a bit so now currently our left pointer is here right pointer is here right now if we see left is equal to 3 right is equal to 5 if that is the case left is actually less than right and this is what the golden thing we wanted now we can clearly determine that this whole portion 3 4 5 that is completely sorted because this is completely sorted all we will have to do is just use binary search uh, in order to find the target value so what we are going to do is we are going to compare uh, the middle value so middle value in this case is 4 4 is actually exactly the target value we are looking for so we will return the index position of 4 which is 1 in this case as the answer and the answer over here is going to be the one that we are going to return now after explaining this whole thing let me quickly go over one of the examples to see that how we will solve optimal solution using binary search okay so now as mentioned we are actually going to do the binary search operation on this rotated sorted array right and the target we are trying to find is the value number zero now now we are going to use our two pointer so first pointer we have is left that is located at this position number three and right pointer is located posi this position number two in this case currently left is actually greater than right which is not what we want so now we will have to determine that which portion of the array is sorted and based on that where this target uh, value could lie so we are going to compare with with the middle value so in this case the middle value is going to be seven right so now we have this value number seven that is located as the middle value okay now for this middle value we are going to compare it with left and right value so currently if we see left is actually less than middle value and this is what we wanted the moment we identify left is actually less than middle value we can clearly determine that this whole portion is completely sorted okay now we will compare the target value we are looking for with the values of left and mid so if we see the target value is actually outside the scope of this uh, left and mid which means that target value cannot exist between these places immediately we can determine that so we will ignore all of these cases and now we will have to update our left pointer to go on the right side of the middle pointer 
so we will do that so now we will have our left new left value the located at this position and the new right value located at this position now we are again trying to find the value zero okay now immediately over here we can see that left by itself is actually zero so that makes our life much more easier and we can simply return the index value of this left to be five as the answer and in this case we are going to return answer as the five and basically all we are doing is we are actually using the middle value to determine that which portion of the array is sorted depending on that and based on the target value we decide that which way we will have to make the jump and then we get our desired answer if we see time complexity in this case the time complexity is actually going to be big go of log n only why because uh, remember in a single iteration we were able to get rid of all of these elements immediately which means every single iteration we are doing like half uh, we are getting rid of half of the elements so, so that is why the time complexity is log n and that is what we wanted if we see space complexity in this case the space complexity is actually going to be constant space because we are not using any, any additional data structure so first of all we are going to define a couple of variables left and right okay now we are going to initialize our while loop that while left is less than or equal to right and inside our loop first of all we are going to calculate the mid pointer now we are going to check for the condition that if the given value of mid if that is equal to target if that is the case we can simply return the index at mid okay if that is not the case now we will have to first of all define that which portion of the mid pointer is actually completely sorted so first let's put the condition that if the given value of left if that is less than or equal to whatever the value of mid is if that is the case we can define that the values between left and mid is completely sorted right so now all we will have to do is we will have to see that where target lies does it lies between left and mid value or it lies uh, somewhere else so first we are going to see that what if the target lies outside of left and mid value if target lies outside basically we will have to update our left pointer to go mid plus one and we will continue with our journey if that is not the case which means target lies between left and mid and if that is the case we will have to update our right pointer to come between left and mid so we will do right uh, equal to mid minus one okay now uh, we take care of the scenario that the numbers of left is not less than or equal to mid which means that the values between mid and uh, right is actually sorted and if that is the case again we are going to repeat the same process first we are going to check that whether the target value is outside the scope of mid value and right pointer so if the value is outside of the scope which means we will have to update our right pointer to search on the other portion of the array so right is going to become mid minus one and if that is not the case which means that the values lies between uh, mid and right value if that is the case we will update our left pointer to search between uh, mid and right so left would become mid plus one and basically this uh, loop should take care of the scenario and we would be able to find our answer and uh, just for the sake of uh, putting something outside so we don't get a compilation error we are going to return minus one but our answer would have been returned by this now let's try to run this code okay seems like our solution is working as expected let's submit this code and our code runs pretty efficiently compared to a lot of other solutions and uh, i would be posting this solution in the comments so you can check it out from there thank you today we are going to do three sum lead code problem and it is a very interesting problem if we see some of the companies where i want to get a job who have already asked this question there are companies like amazon microsoft apple facebook uber bloomberg google tesla byte dance and linkedin so that's why i'm paying my utmost attention i hope you also enjoy the video so this is a lead code medium problem and also a very well like problem on lead code basically we are given an integer array called nums and we need to return the triplets now we need to return the triplets such that the sum of all of those triplets is actually equal to zero and we are also given the definition that the uh, elements has to be unique so i j and k is supposed to be the triplets and they should not be the same they should be different values we are also told that the answer set must not contain any duplicate triplets so this is an additional set of uh, complexity that we will have to take care of now let's try to understand this problem with couple of examples that are provided over here and i have actually uh, broadened these examples so let's try to understand them so suppose this is the input array nums we are given we need to find the triplets such that uh, the sum of each uh, of all the triplets is equal to zero 
so if we see that in this example we can actually find the sum of these three values to be zero so first of all we are going to add these three entries into our answer that minus one zero and one uh, this triplet equals to zero so we can add that to our answer list a uh, second triplet we can find is the value minus one again minus one and value plus two because minus one plus minus one plus plus two is also equal to zero so again we can add it to our answer set uh, that two minus one and minus one as the answer and now apart from that we cannot find any more triplet so th this is the only answer we are going to return uh, one critical thing to understand over here is that this minus one is actually using two times uh, in two different answers that is perfectly fine but we cannot have an answer where we already have the value like minus one zero and minus one and again we have the value minus one zero and plus one this should not be the answer so this is one of the conditions that is given uh, second condition is that all the values of i j and k has to be unique so they are located at unique positions uh, because we cannot use the same value again and again we cannot do something like 0 plus 0 plus 0 equal to 0 and return that as the answer of the triplet because in this case we only have one zero not three zeros so just keep all of these things in mind if we take a look at the second example over here we actually do not have any pair that equals to zero right so in this case we are only going to return an empty array as the answer and basically this is what the problem is asking us, us to solve now there can be two potential solutions for this three sum problem that we are trying to deal with uh, first solution is actually a two sum problem solution that is also another lead curve problem where we use hashing to generate the solution for this two sum problem uh, second solution is two sum two problem where we actually use two pointers to come up with the, that solution and in this case we are going to see that how using hashing we can solve this three sum problem or how using two pointers we can solve this three three sum problem because both of this concept can be useful uh, we can choose either one of them now i'm going to show you uh, the theoretical knowledge of both the problems but i'm only going to show you coding for this two sum two problem uh, let me know in the comments if you want to see the code for this two sum problem as well and i can uh, show it to you okay so first let's see that what is going to be the optimal solution using the solution we used in the two sum problem now if you want to know more about two sum problem you can check out my video over here and that is going to give you much more clarity okay now let's get back to the our question so if we suppose this is the original input that we are given and we are trying to find a set of triplets that sum up to zero right which means we are trying to find three different values where i plus j plus k is equal to zero okay th that is the whole idea the technique we are going to use is that okay suppose this is the first value right suppose if we consider i is equal to minus five once that is done what we will have to do is we will have to try to find that if j plus k is equal to plus 5 if that exists inside this remaining array if that is the case then we would actually have a triplet called i plus j plus k that sums up to 0 because i is equal to minus 5 j plus k is equal to plus 5 and now we simply need to see that inside the remaining array do we have a pair j plus k that is equal to plus 5 and that was actually the original question for this two sum problem so that is how everything is linked internally the idea is okay that we can find it easily using a hash map or a hash set and then we would be able to get this answer the problem that would come in this case is that because we are trying to avoid duplicates and what would happen with this approach is that okay suppose uh, if we consider i is equal to minus 5 right we would actually have an answer where the values of minus 5 0 and plus 5 exist as one of the answer and we are able to generate this okay so now we are able to say that okay this minus 5 we have already taken care of and we found the correct answer but if we look somewhere inside the remaining array we would also find another minus 5 so when we try to repeat the same logic basically even for this minus 5 we will also have the i is equal to minus 5 and we will try to find j plus k is equal to plus 5 then again we would have another answer that also looks like minus 5 0 and 5 and remember these is going to be the duplicate value that we are trying to avoid so in order to make our lives easier what we can simply do is if we take this input array and if we sort this input array and because if we when we sort this input array we are going to have the same looking values right next to each other so we can all only have a condition that the moment we find out that two adjacent values they are same if that is the case that if we find the two adjacent values to be the same then we are simply going to ignore that case and move on to the next value okay so now after this whole, whole explanation uh, let me clean this up a bit and uh, create the sorted array
okay so now we have our sorted array right now we are trying to we have, will try to see that what could be the potential i j and k values now based on the i value we will also have to determine that what should be the j plus k value and based on the j -th value we will also have to determine that what should be the k -th value right that is how we are going to do the things so first let's try to see that if uh, i is equal to minus 5 if i is equal to minus 5 we will have to find j plus k is equal to plus 5 if we have to find j plus k is equal to plus 5 we will try to start iterating over this remaining array again we are going to create a hash map or a hash set over here so let's create a hash set first okay now uh, we are going to start iterating over all the remaining values okay so suppose this value is minus 5 so we'll try to consider j to be minus 5 if j to j is equal to be minus 5 then k has to be plus 10 and now uh, we are trying to see that okay we'll see that if this k is equal to 10 exist if that is the case we will return that if it does not exist we are going to add that value to our hash map okay okay so because k is equal to 10 does not exist we will have to add all the values to our hash map and remember there is a property of a hash set where it does not exist duplicate value so we will only have unique values inside over here so since j is equal to minus 5 didn't work we'll try to see that whether j is equal to minus 3 works or not so if j is equal to minus 3 then in that case we will need the kth value to be plus 8 uh, plus 8 also does not exist and we can look that up immediately because of this hash set right now we'll try to find another value okay so if that didn't work we'll try to see that whether j is equal to 0 works or not okay so if j is supposed to be 0 then the value of k has to be plus 5 okay that we can look up immediately and we would be able to find that k is equal to plus 5 already exists inside our hash map so immediately we found that we are actually going to have an answer list where we are going to populate the values of ij and k we found okay so we are going to add the values minus 5 0 and plus 5 immediately now we are going to repeat the same process for the all the remaining values right so and uh, for every single value we will also have to create the new hash set and new i j and k values so we will empty this one okay now the new i value is actually minus 5 the thing is this is a track because we already had a value minus 5 that we already iterated over so we will not have to use this one and that is how we are going to avoid duplicates now suppose if next i value is minus 3 okay so if i value is minus 3 then j plus k has to be plus 3 okay so if j plus k has to be plus 3 let's see that what could be the potential remaining j plus k values over here okay so over here currently j th value is 0 so if j th value is 0 then k th value has to be plus 3 okay so we'll try to see that inside the remaining array whether plus 3 exists or not plus 3 does not exist but that is going to help us fill, fulfill our hash so we are going to add all the entries to our hash map and uh, we couldn't find k is equal to 3 so now we are going to try the new value of j j is equal to 0 so again because this 0 we already consider for j we should not be considering this 0 so we can just simply jump over okay so now next value is j is equal to 1 if j is equal to 1 we will try to see that whether k is equal to 2 exist or not and k is equal to 2 already exist that we can clearly see over here so because it exists we are actually going to have j and k values properly set up and uh, we are also going to add one more triplet to our answer that is minus 3 1 and 2 okay now we can ignore this one okay now current ith value is 0 okay if ith value is 0 then j plus k has to be 0 okay so now we are we will try to find j plus k to be 0 now uh, inside the current method okay now this next value of j potential value of j uh, this is the zeroth value so we will try to add this value and by the way i forgot to clear the hash but it would be cleared okay now uh, if j is equal to 0 then k is also has to be 0 okay so currently k is equal to 0 does not exist inside the remaining array so because it does not exist we will try to jump on to the next value of j if, if j is equal to 1 uh, can work or not so if we try to put j is equal to 1 it is definitely not gonna work and we won't be able to find a pair j plus k is equal to 0 so i is equal to 0 is also not going to work because i is equal to 0 not going to work uh, and uh, uh, and we are we have already taken care of this zero so which means we don't have to see for this zero now we will try to see that whether i is equal to work or not but the question is do we really want to check whether i is equal to work uh, one is going to work or not because inside the remaining array all the values are actually going to be positive values so because these values are going to be positive values j plus k is always going to increase the value of whatever the sum of i j and k is going to be because this i is positive so immediately we can stop our search and whatever the answer we have found we can actually return that as the answer and that is the whole approach 
Now, and uh, if we see time complexity in this case, the time complexity is actually going to be big O of n log n. That is to sort the array plus big O of n square. Why? Because for any single ith value, we will have to find j and kth value, which means for every single one of them, we will have to iterate over the entire uh, list of all the arrays. So that takes like big O of n square and that is the best we can do. If we see space complexity, space complexity is also going to be big O of n because for this sorting operation, it takes big O of n time and plus we are also creating this hash. So that also takes big O of n space. Okay, now we will try to see that what is going to be the optimal solution using the two sum two problem. Now, if you want to learn more about this problem, you can check it out my video over here and this is a very good explanation for that. Now, uh, we are going to use the same example as the input and as mentioned for the reasons uh, explained before, uh, basically we are going to use the sorted array in this case as well. So from this original input, we are actually going to create a sorted array first. So that is going to help us avoid duplicates. Now the again idea is that currently we are going to consider the one value to be i. Okay, so suppose we are going to consider i is equal to minus y. If that is the case, j and k value could be po po potentially possible where j plus k is equal to plus 5, right? And inside this remaining array, we will have to find the plus 5 value. So what we are going to do is we are going to initialize a couple of variables. Uh, so first is going to be left pointer and the second is going to be right pointer. Now every time we are going to do left plus right. If left plus right is equal to 5, then basically we are good. Our life is set and we can simply add it to our uh, j plus k values. If that is not the case, if we somehow find that left plus right is actually greater than 5. If that is the case, then somehow we will have to reduce the sum of this left plus right. How can we reduce the sum of left plus right? By shifting this right pointer on the left, point, left hand side. Why? Because all the values on the left of this right pointer are actually less than whatever this right value we had. And uh, if somehow we identify that, okay, this left plus right is actually less than the answer 5. If that is the case, we are going to update our left pointer to go one step on the right side. So then we would be able to increase the sum that we are trying to achieve. And that is how we would be able to generate the correct J and K values. So let's try to see the approach in action. So suppose currently the ith value is equal to minus 5. Okay, i is equal to minus 5, j plus k is equal to plus 5 we are trying to find. Okay, so once we have the j plus k value we are trying to find, we are going to initialize two variables left and right. Okay, so currently our left pointer and right pointer we are going to be concerned with that. And we are also going to be concerned with left plus right sum and uh, how it, that is referring to whatever the value we are trying to find. Okay, so currently the target value is 5. Okay, now the current left position is minus 5, current right position is plus 5. So left plus right is equal to 0. 0 is actually less than minus 5. So because 0 is less than minus 5, we will have to update the value of our left pointer to go one step on the right. So now the current left pointer is minus 3. Minus 3 plus 5. So my, if we do minus 3 plus 5, the value we get is 2. 2 is still less than 5. So because 2 is less than 5, again we are going to update our left pointer. So now the left pointer is at 0th position right over here. Uh, and uh, currently the sum we are going to get is that okay this is 0 this is 5 so 0 plus 5 is equal to 5 so currently left plus right is equal to 5 5 is exactly what we are looking for based on this uh, remainder value we have created okay so now this left pointer can be assigned to this j value and right pointer can be assigned to this k value and we can actually populate our answer so inside our answer we are going to have the first entry called minus 5 0 and plus 5 as one of the answer okay now we are done with taking care of this minus 5. So now we will have to take care of this another value. But again, same thing. This value is also minus 5, same as the previous value. So again, we are going to ignore this case as well. And now currently our i is going to be minus 3. Okay. So now if we put our i to be minus 3, uh, our j plus k sum has to be plus 3 in this case. Okay. So j plus k has to be plus 3. Again, if j plus k has to be plus 3, we will also have to update our left and right pointer. So currently left pointer is also going to be at the position 0. Right is going to be position number 5. Okay. And we will also have to update this value as well that this has to be 3. Okay. Now, uh, currently 0 plus 5 is actually 5. 5 is actually greater than 3. So because 5 is greater than 3, we will have to reduce the value of our right pointer. So currently our right pointer is going to come over here. So now the right pointer value is actually 2. Okay. So if we do 0 plus 2, 0 plus 2 is actually going to be 3. So 3, uh, sorry. So now if we do 0 plus 2, 0 plus 2 is actually actually going to be 2. 2 is now less than uh, whatever the value of 3 is. 
because of that we will have to update our left pointer to go on the right side now the moment we do that okay this value is also zero same as the previous value so because of that because we have already calculated this zero we are actually going to ignore this zero as the left pointer and our left pointer is going to come over here okay so now the value of our left pointer is actually one so one plus two so one plus two is actually three and three is what we are looking for that we already find the answer so we are also going to populate the values of left and right over here and inside the answer we are going to have one more entry called minus three plus one and plus two okay now uh, okay now we have taken care of uh, all the cases now again this value i is equal to zero if i is equal to zero we will not be able to generate the answer and now in this case i is going to be one so that is going to be the positive value so because of that we are actually going to break out of it and simply whatever the answer we have found we are able to return that as the answer using this two pointer solution and even for if we see the time and space complexity in this case the time complexity is also going to be big o of n square uh, plus big o of n log n why because we will have to do the sorting operation uh, if we see space complexity the space complexity is also going to be big o of n that is going to depend on the implementation for the sorting we are using uh, so that is how we are able to generate the solution if you see in this case we are actually not using any additional hash set so that is a plus benefit in my opinion and if you show both the approaches in an, any interview interviewer would be like more than happy with you so first of all we are going to sort the given input nums and we are also going to create a new variable called result to store the list of lists that is needed over here now we are going to run a for loop across the given input nums. Notice inside the for loop we are only running it up until the point where the value of uh, nums of i is actually less than 0. Uh, and the moment it gets greater than 0 there is no point in continuing with the loop so we just uh, simply ignore that. Now inside the loop uh, we are actually going to call our do sum to function but for that we actually have a couple of conditions that we are going to take care of. So first condition is that if the given value of i is equal to 0 or the starting position then we do it or we check that whether the two adjacent values of i and i minus 1 are the same or not. If they are not same then only we call our do sum to function otherwise we ignore that particular entry. Inside the method uh, we are going to call the do sum to method uh, where we are going to pass in the value of the given input integer nums, the current ith position and the result uh, variable and basically that's it once this for loop ends basically by with the help of this do sum to method our result should have been populated so we can simply return the result now it's time to create the new do sum to method first of all we are going to initialize two uh, pointers called left and right now we are going to have our while loop that while left is less than right we are going to do some interesting things first of all we are going to have a variable called sum that is going to calculate the current total sum now we are going to check that if the given sum if that is less than zero if that is the case we will have to increase the value of the left pointer else if we are going to check that if the given sum is greater than zero if that is the case then we will have to reduce the value of our right pointer and if both are not the cases which means our current sum is exactly zero so first of all we are going to add a new entry to our result uh, variable that we have created after adding the values to the result we will again have to update our left pointer until the point that whether the two adjacent values of left pointer they are same or not basically that's it this should have taken care of all the scenarios and uh, this should be working now let's try to run this code okay seems like our solution is working as expected let's submit this code and our code runs decently efficiently today we are going to do container with most water lead code problem and if we see some of the companies where i want to get a job we already asked this question there are companies like amazon apple google microsoft facebook goldman sachs ByteDance, bloomberg tiktok uber and tesla so that's why i'm paying my utmost attention i hope you also enjoy the video this is a lead code medium problem and also very well like problem on lead code and like any lead code problem we are given some input and we are expected to get some results uh, from this particular input but before we start understanding this problem uh, first let's see this concept that i am trying to explain okay so suppose we are given a container that looks like this and we are trying to see that how much water 
can we fill in this container? Well, the uh, logic is actually quite simple. We can only fill water up until this point inside this given container. Uh, anything more, if we try to add water over here, that water would simply spill out. We won't be able to fill our water above this line. So that is a given fact, right? That is a very simple explanation. Now, if I ask you that how much water is present in this container? So then in that case, the answer is simple. There can only be water up until this point, nothing more than that. So in this case, uh, for this particular container, rather than considering this container to be a container, if we consider this to be a rectangle, things becomes easy for us. Because we know that uh, the surface area of rectangle is the amount of water we can store in this particular container. And we know the formula to calculate the area inside any given rectangle. Suppose this is the height of the container and this is the width of the container. If we are given these two values, basically if we do H times W, height crosses height multiplied by width, we will get the amount of area and that would equivalent that how much water we can hold uh, in any given container. Now let's uh, try to understand another scenario. Suppose we are given a container that looks like this or we are given a container that looks like this. In these two cases, how much water can we store? Well, the answer is again simple. We can only fill water up until this point till the lower edge on, on any given container, not more than that. So now in this case, we are actually given two different heights for each sides of the given container, right? So suppose this side is H1 and this side is H2 and same goes over here. This one is H1 and this one is H2. If that is the case, if we try to calculate the area in this case, the area equation for the water is going to change. Why? Because we are not going to use H1 over here uh, because this is the higher side. We are actually going to use H2 which is the lower side. So in this case, uh, the area is going to be H2 times width for this particular container. But for this particular container, the uh, equation is actually going to be H1 times width because this H1 is actually smaller in this case. So these are the two concepts that you will have to understand. And now let's go back to the problem. Okay, so now in the problem, we are actually given an array called heights uh, of length n. And now if we try to plot this array of height in on a graph, uh, we can consider that based on the x axis, we can actually create a container. And then we need to find that what is the container we can create that contains the most amount of water. And then we need to return the amount of water that the maximum container can store. Now I know that the wording may sound confusing, so it would be better by understanding with this example. Suppose we are given an array heights like this. So if we try to plot this array heights on a graph, we can actually get a graph that looks like this. Now in this graph, you can see that there is a difference between lines and based on these line differences, we can actually create some sort of containers between any two vertices uh, and the amount of water we can fill depending uh, will depend on the lower side of the height rather than uh, higher side of the height. So in this case, we can actually create a container that looks like this. So if we try to consider this index number one and index number four, uh, the container we can create is going to look like this, where this is the amount of water we can fill, nothing more than that. Now remember, uh, as mentioned earlier, that for every single time, if we want to calculate that what is the amount of water we can find, we need to calculate the area of the presumed rectangle. And for that, we need the height, which we already have based on these values, which we can derive from the array and we need the value of the width. So width we can achieve by calculating the difference between any two places uh, on the x axis and uh, these values we can determine depending on the index values of the given input array. So it makes our lives easier. Uh, so in this case, if we try to see that some of the containers that we can make, we can make a container that looks like this amongst these two values and then we can calculate its water. So I'm just showing you for an example. So in this case, the minimum height is actually five. So height is going to be five and uh, the width in this case is actually going to be two. So five times two, we can say that, okay, there is 10 units of water we can put in this container if this was to be the be the container. The thing is, we are trying to find the maximum uh, con maximum water we can make amongst any given container. So in this case, the answer is actually going to be this container uh, where the current height is seven among seven and eight. So we are going to choose seven as the height. Okay, so H is equal to seven. So, okay, uh, it's going to be seven times 
the distance so distance in this case okay this value is 2 and this value is 9 so distance is also 7 so in this case 49 is the maximum unit of water we can contain and that is going to be stored between this container uh, and basically i hope that this makes understanding this pro problem easier and after understanding the problem now let's focus on different solutions that we can achieve the first approach we have is a brute force approach and suppose this is the input we are given if we try to plot it on a graph we can actually create a graph that looks like this now the idea is we are actually going to check every single container that we can possibly make and depending on that we will try to see that what is the what container contains the most amount of water so basically we are going to have two variable uh, first variable is called area to contain to calculate the water at any given container and second is going to be the max variable that is going to be update its value whenever we find a better area or maximum water we can contain right so first we will start with this first index and we will try to see that okay what is the container we can make with between the index 1 and 2 we can make a container that looks like this what is the container we can make between 1 and 3 we can make a container that looks like this uh, and say so on and so forth we will keep on repeating our uh, graph after being done with this value number 1 we will ignore that and uh, we will start focusing from value number 2 so from value number two we can make container that looks like this and then again a container that looks like this and blah blah so on and so forth and eventually we would find an answer in this case between this con uh, value number two and seven indexes that the if we make this container that is going to hold maximum amount of water and in this case the answer is going to be okay so for this area height is going to be four because that is the smaller amongst these two and the width is actually going to be five because two minus seven is five so maximum area is going to be 20 and 20 is the answer we are going to return so this solution would work as expected but if we see the issue with this solution the issue is actually time complexity why time complexity because for every single value we are comparing it with all the other values to see what is the container we can create and we are not doing things efficiently so basically the time complexity in this case is big of n square which is very bad and we will have to uh, do something better so let's see that what is the better approach we can get So for the optimal solution, we are actually going to use two pointers to our advantage and uh, we will try to see that what is the optimal container we can make. So we are going to have a pointer left located at the first position and we are going to have a pointer right located at the last position. The idea is both pointers are going to come towards each other until they meet or cross each other. Now every single position we will try to see that depending on the values of left and right what is the container we can make. Uh, and then we will try to calculate its area and after calculating the area we are going to compare the heights between left and right and whichever has greater height uh, we are going to keep that height and then we are going to update the remaining counter so left counter, counter will go on the right side or right, right counter will come on the left side. Uh, so let's see the solution in action and it will make more sense so basically uh, initially first if we see currently the height at left is 3 and height at right is 2 okay so if we want to calculate the area we are going to cal calculate the smaller amount okay so currently the smaller height is actually 2 and if we see the width width in this case is going to be 7 okay so current area we are able to calculate is 14 uh, we are also going to have a variable called max area so currently the max area we have been able to find is 14 okay so far so good now we will try to compare the heights between left and right okay so currently left height is actually greater so it is in our interest to move right counter one step to the left rather than moving the left counter okay so in this case right counter is going to come at come over here now again we are going to repeat the same process so now currently the height at right counter is 6 and left counter is 3 okay so now if we, we will have to calculate the area again so we are going to choose the smaller value amongst the height so currently this is going to be 3 as the smaller height and width is going to be 6 okay so currently the area we can get is 18 18 is greater than 14 so we are going to update the max maximum area uh, maximum water we can contain to 18 uh, now we are going to compare the height between left and right now in this case the height at right is actually greater than left so we are going to update our left pointer to go one step to the right uh, now this left pointer is located over here currently the height is 2 the, again we are going to calculate the area so this height is actually going to become 2 and the width is actually going to become 5 so 2 times 5 is actually 10 uh, so because 10 is less than 18 we are not going to update the maximum value we have been able to find again we are going to calculate the heights between left and right so again right uh, height is greater so we will update the left pointer to go on one step on the right side uh, now currently 
the height over here is 7 and uh, currently the other height is 6 so we are going to choose the smaller height so the height we are going to choose is going to be 6 uh, 6 times the width is going to decrease okay so currently the width value we have is going to be okay this is uh, okay this is left pointer so 3 minus 1 4 okay so uh, 6 times 4 on um, so this area becomes 24 24 is actually greater than 18 so because 24 is actually go greater than 18 we are going to update the maximum area we are being able to calculate okay so this is 24 now again we are going to compare the heights between the left pointer and right pointer so currently right pointer is actually less so now we will have to update the uh, value of the right pointer so currently this becomes our right pointer now this value is 3 this value of left pointer is 7 so again the height is actually going to be 3 and the width is going to be 3 as well so this is going to be 3 times 3 so this is 9 we don't we don't need to update the max value again if we compare the heights the right is actually smaller so again we will update the value of the right counter so now this time the right counter is reaching at this value number one so if we calculate the this container this container the uh, area is actually going to be 2 so uh, 2 times 1 so 2 times 1 is only 2 so we don't need to do anything again we will update the right counter so currently the value of route right counter is 4 and the left counter is 7 okay so we are going to have a container that looks like this so 4 times 7 uh, sorry uh, 4 times 1 is going to be 4 as well uh, so then we in this case we don't need to update the max value and if we try to update the left or right variable again that they would cross each other so because they would cross each other now we can end up get out of our loop so whatever the maximum result we have found so far that is going to be the solution we need to return so in this case the answer is actually going to be 24 as that this is the maximum units of water we can contain between uh, basically this container this water container and uh, that is the answer we need to return uh, if you see the beautiful thing about this solution uh, this whole solution gets completed in a single iteration uh, between these two pointers and if we see time complexity in this case the time complexity is actually going to be big of n only which is much better improvement compared to our brute force approach which had the time complexity of big of n square which was really bad so we can avoid that if we see space complexity if the space complexity is also really good because apart from using a couple of pointers we are not using any additional space so space complexity is actually constant space which is wonderful uh, and uh, this is a very good approach and a very good way to learn two pointer problem and uh, i hope you understood it now let's move on to the coding first of all we are going to initialize couple of variables so first variable is going to be max and that is that we are going to initialize it to zero uh, then we are going to initialize two pointers left and right and left is going to have the value of zero and right is going to have the value of whatever the length of heights array is so we run our while loop that while left is less than right now first of all we will have to calculate the width so width is going to be right minus left so now we have the width and we already have the height from this heights array we will calculate the area so this uh, equation should give us the area we are selecting the lesser height amongst right height and left height and uh, now we will see that whether we need to update the max value as well and now we will have to update our left or right pointer so we will check that okay if the current height of left is that is less than or equal to the right height we will update the left counter if that is not the case we will update the right pointer to go one step on the left side and uh, in the end we can simply return the max variable that we have calculated and that should be it let's try to run this code okay seems like our solution is working as expected and our solution runs pretty efficiently compared to a lot of other solutions and i would be posting this in the comments so you can check it out from there thank you